Hello, friends. My grandmother remembers that the first time she met the man who would become her husband and my future grandfather, uh, he was performing a duet with his twin brother. They were identical twins, engineers. Uh, they were uh, smashingly handsome and they were a big hit. And they were performing a number uh, that was one of their most popular. It was about a girl holding a bottle of Tejé perfume. And uh, I always loved hearing the story and it's part of family lore. And uh, I imagine this perfume Tejé is something French, very romantic. And um, well, it was, I was trying to find uh, mentions of it, but I couldn't uh, locate any mention of Tejé perfume in any databases and I asked uh, some perfumers, uh, older perfumers, and they also couldn't identify anything. And uh, it was not until I was reading a book uh, by Karl uh, Schlögel uh, called The Scent of Empire that I realized that it was not uh, Tejé, um, a French uh, uh, TG, it was actually a Russian acronym, uh, TG, um, and it stood for the State Trust of Fat and Bone Processing Industry, which was, well, if you will, the um, LVMH of the Soviet Union, because it was a trust that combined different industries, uh, different uh, factories that produced soaps and candles and perfume. So Tage became a brand in its own right. It had uh, many different fragrances, including a fragrance that basically gave uh, Soviet Union its scent. It was Red Moscow. Red Moscow is rightly uh, called number five of uh, the Soviet Union. And uh, Karel Schlöger's book is really about that link between number five and Red Moscow. Well, in fact, it's the story uh, that's, uh, that's really quite fascinating. And uh, it's a story of two perfumers. It's stories of two countries, of two centers of perfumery, and uh, of people who made um, the era or gave the era its olfactive expression. This year marks uh, the 100th anniversary of the launch of Chanel No. 5. And uh, of course, information on Chanel Number no. Five is really it's that it's vast. Uh, there are books written about it. Uh, there are books about Coco Chanel and even some information about Ernest Beau, the perfumer who created Number no. Five. On the other hand, uh, on Red Moscow, there is not as much information. And of course, perfumer in the Soviet Union it actually might seem like an oxymoron to some people. Uh, especially those who think that Soviet Union was just something gray and dreary and there was um, no light and sunshine in that place, not to mention perfumes. But um, Schlagel explains why it was not the case, why in fact uh, how the perfume industry developed in the Imperial Russia and how it was revived in the Soviet Union. And in fact, the route uh, between um, the routes between uh, Number Five and Red Moscow are quite deep, because both perfumers um, Ernest Beau, who created Number Five in 1921, and Auguste Michel, who created Red Moscow in 1925, uh, they were linked. At first, they worked and studied in the same company, Raleigh. Raleigh was a French uh, perfume house that established itself in the Russian Empire in the 19th century, and it was really uh, on the eve of the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. It was really one of the big uh, producers of perfumes and cosmetics. And there was a second house, Brocard. Um, Auguste Michel, the perfumer behind Red Moscow, started working for Raleigh and then he went to Brocard. And Brocard was also a French house, uh, also very popular uh, at uh, the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th. And it was especially popular for soaps. 
because if you might remember my video about Ukrainian hand towels and embroideries inspired by uh, soap packaging, it was Broca who created these embroidery patterns and inserted into the packaging with the soap bars. And so when people bought the soap, they received a free embroidery pattern too. And that was marketing and quite successful. And um, Ernest Beau and Auguste Michel worked together, studied together. They were both inspired by work on aldehydes that was done by uh, perfumer uh, Robert Bienamé at Ubigan. And um, so there were fragrances that were created before the Bolshevik Revolution, uh, respectively by Bo and uh, Michel, uh, that explored this floral aldehydic motif. And uh, when the Bolshevik Revolution happened, Bo, like many foreigners, uh, left. Uh, Russia and uh, went uh, into into well a self-imposed exile, and uh, that's how he met later in Paris uh, Coco Chanel through his Russian imperial connections, and uh, he was able to create a fragrance for her. Auguste Michel, uh, however, couldn't leave. At first, he couldn't leave uh, Russia because uh, his papers were misplaced. And uh, then his paper, papers were discovered, but he could not depart, or he decided not to depart because he was offered a job as a perfumer. Right after the, uh, the revolution, of course, it was a very turbulent period, and uh, in the whole uh, uh, former Russian Empire, and um, you know, perfume was the last thing on people's mind. However, the creation of uh, soaps, of household things high for hygiene, it was very important. And that was the realization that uh, that industry needs to be revived. However, most of the experts were foreign and the search was launched for a perfumer who could um, uh, revive the industry. And the industry was nationalized, uh, and that's eventually how Tege, the state trust of fat and bone processing industry, was created. And um, the person in charge of reviving the perfume industry in the Soviet Union was another fascinating individual about whom this book has a full chapter, and that chapter is worth the price the book alone. Her name... Um, was Polina Zemchuzhina. Uh, Polina Zemchuzhina Molotova, Molotov, um, whom you might know as uh, the architect of the pact between Stalin and Hitler in 1939. Um, Molotov was her husband, but Polina Zemchuzhina was um, a quite a prominent individual, indi energetic and full of ideas in her own right, and she was put in charge of reviving um, the whole cosmetic and perfumery manufacturing in the Soviet Union. I will not give a, away too many details about what happened. It's a story with many twists, many tragedies. Uh, but I will say this. Um, when Auguste Michel created Red Moscow in 1925, it was really to, um, to create a fragrance that would define the uh, the era that would be kind of capture the zeitgeist of the period and also be luxurious and special. And that fragrance was. Um, I remember the smell of Red Moscow growing up. I didn't particularly like it, mostly because it was associated um, for me with May Day parades and other, you know, holidays, um, communist holidays. And uh, I did not particularly like these mandatory activities uh, as a child. And for holidays, you know, uh, women would put on their best and Red Moscow was among the most expensive perfumes made in the Soviet Union. So it was used on the most special of occasions. Now, when I smell it, um, I feel this kind of tinge of nostalgia for it, as we tend to do for things that are in the past. Um, 
but I wouldn't wear it myself. And uh, the interesting question that this book raises in the, um, is whether Chanel Number no. 5 and Red Moscow are copies of each other. Of course, Auguste Michel uh, knew the work of Ernest Beau um, before uh, the Russian Revolution, and he was working on similar fragrances because both uh, perfumers uh, were curious about the same uh, idea, this combination of florals and aldehydes. Aldehydes are organic chemical materials. Uh, they occur in um, uh, citrus fruit, in orange peel, for instance, in cinnamon, in roses. Um, just to give you a few examples, and in their pure state, they smell really harsh, almost unpleasant. But when they're used in minute quantities, especially with florals, they add this unprecedented radiance and luminosity. And uh, it, it's really fascinating. Chanel number no. five uh, is, uh, uh, its formula, of course, is different from what it used to be in 1921, but you can still understand that luminosity, how the top notes just sparkle and shimmer. And uh, so Auguste Michel uh, was working on similar ideas uh, while Ernest Beau left uh, Russia, uh, Michel continued alone and he continued his own explorations, his own experiments. So the choice of floral aldehydes for Red Moscow, a new fragrance, a fragrance that represented a new era, a new epoch, uh, it was not uh, incidental. It was because it was new. The accord was new, it was interesting, it was intriguing, and that's what went into the structure of the fragrance. Are these fragrances copies of each other? Uh, that's a question that many ask and, uh, you know, even if they're similar, it does not remove the genius uh, behind either Michel's work or Beau's work. Uh, they have similar accords, that's true, the floral aldehydic, but the two fragrances are different and I've smelled the original versions of uh, the two perfumes, so I can confirm that uh, there are differences, there are significant differences, and uh, it's uh, not simply like a formula was just one formula was interpreted slightly. You can see that the, both perfumers were interested by similar ideas, but they interpreted them in a different way. Chanel number no. five is much more luminous, it's uh, heavier on vanilla and animalic notes, musk, um, but it's, uh, it's given this radiance and uh, brightness with citrus and also particular grade of rose and jasmine and ylang ylang. That's a very important note in Chanel number no. five. Um, and from my personal opinion, it's even more important than the uh, much discussed uh, jasmine and rose because without Ilan Ilan, there is no number five. Red Moscow is uh, velvety. Iris and sort of mossy notes are key for that uh, formula. And um, it's enveloping, it's rich, it's heavy in the way that number five isn't. Um, you know, to me, it smells like red velvet. If number five is uh, red satin, then red Moscow is red velvet, plush, uh, uh, sumptuous. So, Tejay survived the collapse of the Soviet Union, and uh, Nova Zara is the company, New Dawn is the company that still makes uh, red Moscow, if you're curious. Um, what it smells like, you can buy it, it's quite inexpensive. Um, I wouldn't say that it's particularly a uh, high quality perfume and uh, the original is much richer, but um, what is the same? <laughs> Nothing remains the same and perfume is uh, the least of those things. Um, as for my grandmother, uh, she still talks about that song about a girl holding a bottle of Tejé perfume 
but um, in her own hand, you are much more likely to find something like uh, Sœur Chuletang, Iris Silver Mist, or Bois de Violette. My grandmother has a fabulous taste in perfume as well. And um, if you're curious about the story, I very much recommend the book. And uh, if you read it, I would be curious what you think. So thank you for watching and have a great day.